for the society. Um, so I'd like to start with thanking our co-sponsors, um, SSCS, us as the main sponsor, Circuits and Systems, and Electronics Packaging EPS Society as the co-sponsor of this seminar. And also, let's thank TI, Texas Instrument, for uh, providing the venue and sponsoring the location. Let's have a round of applause for, for TI. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the only thing we do for TI. And um, so after announcement, we go to the seminar. So just, uh, again, just ITP membership and the society membership that I, we always do, uh, please become a member. Um, Oh, actually, this is slide I sent up, up to this slide. The, uh, the SSCS president actually uh, sent us an email just, uh, just last week uh, that there is a promotion going on. So if you become a cast member, you get SSCS for $5. And, and uh, I think the promo codes are um, SSCS X cast, something like that. So instead of like, I'm sorry? Cast is Circus and System Society. So basically, it's just cross uh, promotion between societies. They want to encourage ITP members to become society members. So if you are a Circus and System Society member, uh, you get SSCS for $5 instead of $20, and vice versa. It's just an encouragement for the members. So it's either SSCS X CAS or CAS uh, X SSCS. So that's in 2019 at the end. Um, I'll probably, I could add it to the next email. Uh, that I'll send out uh, to the uh, to the chapter email list that that you get it just just to encourage you guys to become a society member. For future seminars, we have uh, in January Dr. Danny Bankman from Stanford um, on on mixed signal um, ML architecture uh, related topics. In February, uh, for 21st is ISSCC week, so um, and ISSC.org is is the website you could register for ISSCC. We could probably have a um, guest speaker uh, from ISSCC, usually a non-local speaker, we could just skip that that month. And we have April Professor Kun Leolo on, uh, on, again, architecture-related uh, uh, topic from Stanford. Um, as for logistics, we do, um, actually, we had invited uh, Professor Imami uh, three, four years ago for a webinar program. Um, she's a distinguished lecturer, so we do the DL um, recording for the society, so we ask you to um, switch off your cell phones and also we do recording for the uh, questions. So if you keep your question to the end of the seminar, so we'd, we'd have running mics and we'd be able to record your, um, your questions at the end. And that was for logistics. And with that, we get to tonight's seminar. Uh, we are um, honored to have Professor Emami, and it's my great pleasure to do the introduction. The talk will be on holistic design in optical interconnects. Um, and as mentioned, uh, she is an SSCS Distinguished Lecturer, and this talk is a DL seminar. Uh, Professor Mohamed received her uh, MS and PhD degrees from Stanford University in Electrical Engineering in 1999 and 2004, and also received her BS degree um, in Electrical Engineering from Sharif University of Technology in 1996. Um, he joined, uh, she joined IBM, TJ Watson Research Center in 2004, as research staff member in communication technologies. And from fall 2006 to 2007, she was an assistant professor in electrical engineering at Columbia University. In 2007, uh, she joined Caltech, where she is now a professor of electrical engineering and medical engineering. And also, she is a Heritage Medical Research Institute investigator and serves as the deputy chair of the Division of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Um, her current research interests include um, a relatively wide areas of uh, research from mixed signal integrated circuits, on chip to chip to chip interconnect system and circuit design, um, to neural recording and biomedical applications. Uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Emami. Thank you. Thank you very much, Moshtaba, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you all for coming here uh, tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Moshtaba mentioned, um, in my group, we work on variety of applications of mixed signal and integrated circuit design, uh, from high-speed data communication to biomedical devices. But Moshtaba today asked me to focus on um, high-speed optical interconnects. 
And today, um, I would like to uh, motivate by saying that it's very important for optical interconnects to take a holistic approach, a co-design approach between electronics and photonics. And that's the main theme of my talk today. I start with a brief introduction, then I talk about receiver uh, transmitter design, then I move to the receiver design for a very energy efficient link um, using photonics. Um, so if you look at the high-speed data communication requirements for high-speed um, uh, communication systems and high-speed computing systems as well as data centers, if you look at any of these uh, different uh, standards, you see that uh, the trend is still um, kind of holds up that every uh, three to four years, we need to double the data rate per pin uh, for all these applications. Uh, so this is a very uh, difficult trend uh, to keep up with, given that we want to keep uh, the power consumption of these links as low as possible. And this is another view that shows the data rate per pin uh, for different process nodes uh, at different years. This is uh, based on ISSC wireline, tre wireline trends. And as you can see, uh, uh, the technologies that are used over years, there is a trend of using, uh, going to smaller nodes, but still it shows that using smaller nodes not necessarily lead to higher data rates. And maybe this slide, the next slide shows why this is the case. Um, and this is perhaps the most important slide that motivates using optical interconnects, uh, replacing wireline and uh, signaling over wires, is that if you look at the energy efficiency, which is picojoule per bit for data communication, over the channel loss at Nyquist, you see that for every 30 dB channel loss, we need 10 times more of power uh, to send every single bit. And that's one of the main challenges of using signaling over wires as distances increase in data centers and as data rate increases based on the previous slide that I showed. So here is, this is the motivation to move to photonics, but as you know, there are a lot of challenges when we move to photonics. The cost, the integration, uh, the conversion from the photonics domain to electronics domain and vice versa. So moving to optical interconnects only makes sense if we really achieve very low power consumption um, at longer distances that the wires cannot support. So today my talk is focusing on really achieving very low power consumption using optical interconnects at very high speed. And if you look at the power consumption, it is very important to note that um, the power splits here between the electronics, the power that we have at the receiver side, the driver power at the transmitter side, and of course the clocking power that can be significant. But also now we have the power on the photonic side because of the laser power. And uh, because of the losses in the channel, the proportional losses, this laser power can be significant. And depending on type of the links that we have, um, the electronic power can be actually smaller than the power of the laser because also the laser has lower efficiency of about 10 to 20 a percent when, it, when we look at the power from the electrical power conversion to the optical output of the laser. So when we, uh, when we try to optimize for power consumption, it is very important to include the power in the photonics domain and, uh, and include all the optical losses that we have. So that brings me to um, to this issue of holistic design, because now we have the power of the, uh, in the photonics domain and electronics domain, we see that the trade-offs really in the electronic domain and photonic domain are very much entangled. Uh, and especially at the transmitter side, it is very important to co-design the optical modulator or even the Vixel if we have a laser driver to co-optimize and co-design our optical devices with our electronic devices. 
And then also at the receiver side, if we want to reduce the power in optical domain, we really need a very high sensitivity receiver. And again, there is this optimization and trade-off between power consumption of the receiver uh, on the electronic side and the sensitivity of the receiver, because the more sensitive the receiver is, the lower power of laser is needed at the transmitter side. Another key component is the close integration of the optics and electronics. As we bring the electronics and optics closer to each other, again, we have more efficient system and the lower parasitics and lower power consumption. So with keeping that in mind, let's look at the, the opportunities that we have today. And things actually have changed significantly because now we have access to silicon photonics. That promises that not only it's lower cost, but also the performances that are closer to three, five materials, they are competitive, but also allows us as designers to uh, take the same um, kind of approach that we have for integrated circuit design for integrated photonics design. Because now we have an ecosystem and a design environment that is very similar to IC design. We have tools that we can uh, lay out our optical circuits, we can simulate them, we can again, export things to our uh, circuit design environment and co-design the electronics and photonics. And basically, this is the promise of silicon photonics that allows us also to have system in package integration and bring electronics and photonics closer to each other. And there has been significant um, advances in the past 10 years, designing all com different components, modulators, waveguides, uh, photo detectors in silicon domain uh, that, that is allowing us to move towards that direction of co-design. And now we can look at the trade-offs that are entangled between electronics and photonics. And it is very important for circuit designers to understand the photonics and understand the properties of optical devices. And also there is opportunity for us to, to compensate for the shortcoming of photonic devices in electronics domain. And that brings us to this holistic co-design of electronics and photonics that brings new opportunities and even allows us to build new systems. So um, let's start with the transmitter design. And in my group, we have looked at variety of uh, optical transmitters. Uh, we have looked at, um, I'm sorry, let me go back, uh, pixel drivers, um, micro ring modulators, Mach Zender modulators, and electroabsorption uh, modulators. Um, today, I will not talk about pixel drivers, although they're also very important and uh, very attractive for a variety of reasons. Uh, I will talk more about modulator drivers and design of optical modulators themselves. Um, so if you look at an optical modulator, there are basically three ways of modulation. We can either do phase modulation of optics or do amplitude modulation or combine phase and amplitude modulation. And if you look at the key factors, the important parameters for optical modulator design is the insertion loss of the device. Again, goes back to setting the laser power. Uh, so we would like to have very low insertion loss. Uh, the optical efficiency, for instance, if you have a phase modulator, how much voltage for a given length of modulator you need to apply to get a pi of phase shift. Uh, so that's very important, uh, optical bandwidth, uh, parasitics the optical device uh, um, creates, the form factor of the device, and the variation to temperature and process. The thing about optical modulators is that almost all of these parameters are entangled, and there are trade-offs between all of them. For instance, how much insertion loss you get versus the efficiency, and so on. So, so we have many, many parameters that we need to optimize as we design our optical modulators. So let's look at the possibilities of building phase modulators in silicon. Uh, so the easiest way to create phase modulation is to create a PN junction and then change the carrier concentration in a PN junction 
and that leads to change of uh, index of refraction, and therefore we can create phase, uh, phase changes in a device. So by simply having a PN junction, you can create phase modulation. Uh, but the problem with that is that uh, the optical efficiency, meaning the phase shift that you get for a given length is not very much. So if you want to create pi phase shift, you really need a relatively long PN junction. There is a new device that is gaining a lot of attraction. It is, it is called the MOS cap structure. So again, you create a very high capacitance MOS structure that you can change with change of voltage, you change the carrier concentration in the channel, and again, you change the index of refraction and you can get phase shift. So these devices are under research um, and they are actually giving much better results in terms of efficiency and also then you can end up with a smaller length. The problem with long PN junctions is that again, you have a traveling wave situation. You, have a, you don't have a lumped component anymore and design of driver will become uh, more difficult and uh, requires higher power consumption. So these are some of the ways of doing phase modulation as examples. Another uh, way, as I mentioned, to modulate light is to have amplitude modulation. Again, if you look at silicon-based amplitude modulators, uh, the most important one nowadays is the electroabsorption modulators, or EAMs, that are based on the quantum confined effect. So basically, by applying a relatively large voltage or electric field, uh, the band diagram is changed, and effectively, the band gap that the electrons see changes, and therefore, we can uh, create amplitude modulation. These devices are also very attractive because they have good optical efficiency, uh, but they have relatively higher insertion loss compared to PN junction. And as we, as we change and, um, and modulate the amplitude, unfortunately, we also get some phase modulation, and that is called CHIRP. Um, so in some cases, you don't want really to get phase modulation if you're changing the amplitude. But there are also other good things about these devices. They're very small, and they're good for direct modulation, as I mentioned, and they're robust across temperature variation. So now we have either phase modulation or phase and amplitude modulation. What you can do with this, with this uh, modulation schemes, now you can build an uh, optical circuit and use these modulators to, to create any modulation scheme that you want. So you can create NRZ, PAM4, QAM. By putting this phase modulation, for instance, in an interferometer, you can create a mock sender modulator. By adding this phase modulator to a resonator, again, you can build phase and amplitude modulator for NRZ, and I will show later how to do PAM4. And you can, for instance, put two electroabsorption modulation and drive each of them like an NRZ using an NRZ driver and achieve PAM4. So the, the whole point here is that when you get, when you have a scheme of modulation, then there are a lot of options. And here is the way that we can be creative and create optical circuitries that use these modulators in different way to create modulation schemes. So let's, for instance, look at uh, ring resonators. These are, again, you probably have heard about them. These micro ring resonators are very attractive uh, because they're very good options for implementation in silicon photonics. They're very small and very efficient. They require uh, low voltage drives. They can be very fast. And the way that it, they work is that we have a resonator. This is just a waveguide in the shape of a circle. And then there is another waveguide, and there is a coupling here between the, the straight waveguide wave and the circular waveguide. So if you look at the transfer function from the input light to output light, you see a transfer function like this. So at critical coupling is a time that the, as the wave travels uh, around these circles, it sees multiple um, uh, times of two pi phase shift. And that's the critical coupling and where we, you see these notches. Uh, so this is, as you can see, the, when I go one wavelength further, 
then there is another notch. Uh, so, and then the, because there is a small loss in this uh, tank, usually it has a very high quality factor. As you can see, it has a very sharp notch here. So if I take this resonator and start modulating it, for instance, by adding a PN junction here, and a, which is a phase shifter. So if I create a phase shift in this uh, circular resonator, basically I can easily move the notch frequency slightly. And because it's very high quality factor, by very small move of this notch frequency, you can create modulation. For instance, when I move this slightly by changing uh, the index of refraction at the section of this ring, I can move the resonance frequency. And as you can see, uh, if my laser is sitting here at this particular frequency, I can get NRZ modulation and get zeros and ones. And this is the extinction ratio, this is the insertion loss. And the whole point here is that with very small amount of energy, I can move this notch frequency and get very good modulation uh, because this is a high, this has a very high quality factor. And there are many different ways of doing this. As you can see, you can uh, put a PN junction uh, across this with, if this is a waveguide in silicon photonics, and you, you can have PN junction. But there are two main options for you to change the uh, concentration of carriers uh, by carrier injection. When you, when you forward bias your PN junction or carrier depletion, when you reverse bias the PN junction and uh, modulate the voltage across the junction, as I will show you very soon. So as I mentioned, these, these devices are very attractive because they have relatively good optical efficiency, very low insertion loss, low parasitics, and uh, these are, this is also a very attractive solution for wave division multiplexing, which is another major promise of silicon photonics. And uh, so, but the main challenge with these devices is that they need temperature stabilization. As you can imagine, I, if I have a very high quality factor tank, it's a very sensitive device. With a little bit change in temperature, the resonance frequency moves around with process variation. Uh, when we get the device, we don't know exactly where the resonance frequency is. Also, as I will show, there is an inherent, uh, inherent trade-off between the quality factor and bandwidth of these devices. And another thing to keep in mind that as we do this amplitude modulation with this structure, we also get some phase modulation. So it may or may not be a problem depending how you use this device. Um, so let's look at some of the challenges of this device. Uh, one of the things that uh, I mentioned before is that uh, they have usually high quality factor because that's what we want to, to do the modulation with low energy. But the, this brings us to the fact that they are very sensitive to temperature and also uh, the, the, the trade-off between quality factor and bandwidth. Let me start with the trade-off between quality factor and bandwidth. Again, we are circuit designers, so we understand very well the resonant tanks and what it means. So here also you have a resonant tank. And as we modulate it, it means that we have to deplete the optical energy from the tank and put it back in. So it means that um, there is a memory of previous bit if you, if you don't, if you want to do this very fast enough, there is a time constant associated with, and therefore you end up having a memory which will cause inter-symbol interferences. And you can actually write the equations and show that Basically, as you increase the quality factor of the tank, the bandwidth decreases. For instance, this is the quality factor of 3,000 versus 20,000, and this has been shown uh, about 10 years ago. So this is a challenge, and uh, so which is shown here again, this, this uh, uh, limited um, time constant is shown here, which causes ISI. So people have looked at different architecture. For instance, instead of having coupling here, uh, instead of modulating the phase, you can actually modulate the coupling uh, between this waveguide and the tank. And if you do that, you can show that actually you end up with a high-pass filter rather than a low-pass filter. I'm not going to go through the details of it, 
But it means that if you're sending a lot of ones, or for instance, you keep the energy in the tank and then it starts because of the losses in the tank, eventually it starts uh, uh, the energy dissipation, you will see it and it has a high pass filter effect, which is again um, uh, not desirable. So what we did, uh, again, as circuit designer, we started doing our own optical design circuitries. Uh, and by knowing some of these properties, actually we got inspiration with how electrical circuits work. So we came up with this differential uh, ring resonator. And the idea here is to keep the energy in the tank constant, but at the same time continuously adjust the energy of the tank as, it as, as if it tries to go down. And an easy way to do it is to create a differential tank where basically when you send the power in from two sides, as I will show you later on how, how it's done, and then you modulate the tank in a differential manner. So at any given time, you're leaking a little bit of energy either from this side or the other side, and you put back energy into the tank from one side or the other side. So the idea here is that overall, if you look at the energy that is stored in the tank, you are, con you are keeping that energy constant. So you are not going to remove the whole energy of the tank out and put it back in. So every time you leak a little bit of energy into the tank and a little bit of energy out of the tank, and the way that we do it is that we create these variable couplers. So there is a 3 dB coupler, there are phase shifters inside, and we differentially drive these phase shifters to create a variable coupler. So if you, if you look at the actual implementation, it's, it's not too difficult. We just create a Y junction and we send, the, and a, we send two wave guys that provide the energy from the two variable couplers into the tank. And then we have actually two outputs. And this doesn't mean that each output actually has loaned half of the energy. If you compare, this is actually will give you the same transfer function as on any other ring that has been done before. But the nice thing here is that you can use one of these outputs as a monitoring. Uh, you can use it as a drop-off port that you can monitor your tank. And as I will talk about it later on, you can use this to adjust the resonance frequency of the tank uh, in a feedback loop. So uh, we also showed that basically we get the same benefit. So when you're using a resonant tank, again, you, you need lower amount of energy to modulate. And I'm not going through the formulas here, but we showed that similar to any ring resonator, we also uh, have the advantage of uh, lowering VPI or improving the optical efficiency of the device with respect to a Mach Zender interferometer. Also, we wrote the equations and we actually showed that the energy in the tank stays constant. So we looked at the transfer function and we showed that if you look at the total energy that is stored in the tank, uh, it's an all-pass uh, function and the energy is constant. So here is, again, you can, nowadays you can use layout tools for your photonic devices and uh, you, can, uh, you can define when you are coupling the light in, you create Y junction and couplers and all the necessary components. And this is the device that uh, we, we send out for fabrication and, uh, and we test it afterwards by, um, uh, by driving it differentially. So the draw, the, the trade-off here is that this is a differential circuit and we need to drive it differentially. So this was tested and we actually could show that at very high quality factors, we don't see the dependency of the quality factor and bandwidth. In this particular device, we were limited by the, actually by the, connect, uh, by the contacts in IME technology. It was when their technology were not completely uh, mature, but we got good results and we showed that actually we break this dependency of quality factor and bandwidth. And this device also has a heater that we use it to adjust the notch frequency of the tank, uh, which brings me to the topic of how to control the notch frequency uh, using a heater. So let me switch gear here and talk a little bit about the thermal control of the tanks. Uh, so 
Uh, one way to do that is to add a small resistor on top of your ring and drive it with current very simply and heat it up and move the notch frequency accordingly. Another option is when you have the PN junctions for the phase shifters, you actually can use uh, the bias of that PN junction as a mechanism to change the notch frequency. The drawback of using the bias of your phase shifter as a, as a mechanism to move it is that it has a lower range. So for given for different applications, it may or may not be beneficial to use bias tuning. So a lot of people actually use thermal tuning to get enough range to move the notch frequency. So that's the main drawback of using rings. And the reason that rings maybe are not uh, everywhere in industry is that you really need to control them as other circuitries are switching and you have your digital and the, the temperature is changing and this notch frequency is moving around. So we tried to look at this problem. So there are two things that are going on. There is the, the temperature change because other circuits are uh, switching and also there is a self heating going on uh, with the with the rings because again the optical uh, energy in the ring changes and this, and as we, we have different bit patterns there is a self heating effect uh, that can uh, cause the temperature shift uh, in the ring and that's actually one of the other uh, good things about differential ring that doesn't have the self heating problem as much as other rings. So one way that we try to measure actually the absolute temperature of the ring and create then a feedback loop or feed forward loop to control the notch is because in the silicon photonics technology you have PN junction, we actually incorporated a temperature sensor with the, with the ring itself with using a distributed PN junction and creating a PTAT sensor. So by by having these two PN junctions with two different current densities, we can actually create a voltage difference that is proportional to temperature. And by distributing this across the ring, we can actually get a sense of what's the temperature of the ring and use it in a loop. So as you can see, we, we did the console heat transfer simulations to look at the self-heating effect and also the effect as we have a heater on top of our ring and we, as we heat up, we look at how the temperature changes across these PN junctions. And we saw that with the heater on, we can actually 75% of the ring has less than 10% temperature difference with our PTAT sensor. So our PTAT sensor can be used to estimate the temperature of the ring uh, in a very precise, relatively precise way. So our CMOS chip that has the driver and, has the, and drives this heater uh, basically uh, can, can provide the currents that are needed for the PTAT sensor. And then we can create a, a feedback loop, as you can see, and control the heater to always keep the temperature of the ring constant. So this is as opposed to conventional techniques that the way that they do is that they have to actually measure the output optical, take a sample of the optical output power and uh, continuously look at it with the photo detector and make sure that the notch frequency is at the right place. So this is replacing that technique that, um, that is done in the past. So another option actually, as I mentioned, is to do bias tuning. And the nice thing is that as you look at the, the uh, PTAT voltage versus temperature, you see a behavior like this. If you look at the resonance frequency versus temperature, it has a similar uh, increasing uh, behavior. But if you look at the, this resonance frequency versus the bias voltage of your PN junction, uh, there, it has the opposite behavior. So basically now you can use this also in a feed forward manner uh, to change the bias of PN junction and again control the notch frequency, as you can see here. So the, it all takes, uh, what you need to do is to need, you need to set the gain of the loop accordingly, which can be done at the beginning through a calibration. So we did both of this and we showed that it is possible to create, as we change the frequency, the notch wavelength moves, 
But when we have the feed, for, feed forward, for instance, loop, we can keep uh, the notch frequency constant as temperature changes. This is done automatically by changing of the temperature. We leave the loop uh, to stabilize uh, the temperature and the wavelengths of the, of the ring. Again, we designed the chip in the, uh, we designed the silicon photonics chip in IME technology and, this, and the driver and temperature control circuitry in 65 nanometer technology. And we showed that how this uh, uh, feed forward, both feed forward and feedback loops can help us to, uh, to, t uh, to open the eye. Uh, as the temperature changes. So we basically change the temperature of the device on purpose. And as you can see, if there is no correction loop, the eye is completely closed. But when we have the feedback loop, the eye is open at 20 gigabit per second. So um, let me see how much time I have. Um, so I believe I can very quickly talk about this. So uh, this is another, what I would like to emphasize here is that it's, again, very important to look at the modulator and the, the ring and the, and the driver together. So one of the benefits of having carrier depletion modulators is that they can be very fast. But if you look at carrier injection modulators, they are not very fast because you have to, again, deplete the junction very quickly. Uh, uh, and uh, there is a time constant associated with it. But the good thing about carrier injection is that it requires very low voltages. So if you look at the carrier depletion, you may need more than two volts of drive. If you look at carrier injection-based modulator, you need less than one volt sometimes less than 0.5 volt to perform modulation. So one of the things that, for instance, another example that shows that you can design your electronics in a way to compensate for the drawbacks of your photonics is uh, shown with this carrier injection modulators. Again, the problem here is that you have a PN junction. You have to very quickly inject the charge in here and then deplete the charge. And there is a time constant associated with it. So what we did, again, we used pre-emphasis in the electronic side to help this uh, movement of charge and apply momentarily a very a higher voltage to the junction to speed up uh, the depletion and injection of charges. So if you look at these uh, devices very carefully or your PN junction, you very quickly realize that they are very nonlinear. So just linear equalization that is used for wireline communication is not necessarily enough. So it is important that we perform nonlinear equalization. So in this case, for instance, we use switch capacitors to be able to very quickly charge and discharge uh, the junction and momentarily apply a higher voltage across the junction to help uh, and uh, build a faster modulator. So I'm going to just go quickly through this. The way that it works is first we charge the capacitor, uh, as it's shown here, to VDDH. And then in the next phase, we are going to discharge the capacitor across the junction to create a sharp uh, uh, pulse. And this will help us to uh, release charge for rising edge preemphasis. And then we have a separate capacitor for discharge and then we, we can adjust them separately to have different equalization second, settings for rising uh, edges and falling edges because this is a nonlinear device. And, um, and the optimum way to do it is to have separate ways of charging and discharging. And then there is, so there is one pass for rising edge preemphasis. There is another pass for falling edge preemphasis. And there's another pass that makes sure that the device is forward biased. So this is uh, the circuitry. Again, we have a two volt driver that creates a two volt voltage. This is the capacitor that uh, we can charge and discharge into the junction. And the benefit of doing this is that we don't need to always drive it with two volt and it's, uh, it's much lower power consumption. 
So this is one example of how electronics actually can improve the performance of photonics. If you look at the transfer function of just photonic modulator, it's at the level of hundreds of megahertz. But by applying this pre-emphasis technique, we could in increase it to more than 10 gigabit per second. And the nice thing about this carrier injection modulator is extremely energy efficient. The 340 femtojoule per bit, we could modulate this modulator. Um, so as you can see, this is one example that you can take a device that has lower bandwidth in the photonics domain and improve it by applying electronic uh, uh, techniques. So as you can see, this again, this device has a, is a micro ring modulator. Uh, it has the thermal control and it has the nonlinear preemphasis, achieves a very good energy efficiency, as I mentioned. Um, which includes the energy of thermal tuning using bias tuning. Uh, but of course, I have to say that the, way, the tuning range is not very high in this case. Uh, it might be completely okay if you have many of these rings and you're targeting WDM and you can choose which one you're using uh, closer to the wavelengths that you're targeting. So as I mentioned, now that you have different uh, modulation schemes, you can build your optical circuit and build other types of modulation in addition to NRZ. Uh, so right now in my group, we are looking at PAM4 and QAM modulation schemes. We are looking at electroabsorption modulators. Uh, as you can see, one option is just to have a PAM4 driver with a single modulator. It proves to be quite difficult at 100 or 200 gigabit per second, which is the target right now. Another option is that, is that you use two electroabsorption modulators and drive each of them NRZ uh, in, in series. And another option is to put them in parallel and basically create an optical DAC. So you're modulating in one branch NRZ in another branch NRZ with a given DC phase shift, and then you combine them to create a PAM4 in optical domain. So um, again, we are working on a variation. We have designed recently a variation of this uh, that has multiple branches and um, it is under test. Uh, so I don't have measured results for this, but we are targeting 100 gigabit per second PAM for uh, using electroabsorption modulators. So similarly, you can use phase shifters uh, in different branches. Again, you can create Mach Zender modulators using these phase shifters. And right now we are using MOS phase shifters in our recent designs to achieve very uh, low power consumption and uh, create, again, you can have different options of how you generate your PAM4. Uh, you can have two branches of PAM4 drivers like this and combine them in an interferometer basis, or you can have four branches and drive each of them NRZ differentially. So there are a lot of possibilities and different people have been looking, different groups have been looking at different uh, ways of building uh, higher order modulation schemes uh, because we are not targeting uh, 100 gigabit per second, 200 gigabit per second, uh, or even people are talking about 400 gigabit per second. Um, but we still are not there in terms of what we have achieved. These are examples of some of other work that people have reported. Uh, for instance, this is a Mach Zender modulator. As you can see, it's very long and it needs, um, uh, you need traveling waves to drive these modulators. Usually they're very high power. This is another example of PAM4, 50 gigabaud, uh, from another group that combines two Mach Zenders again in an optical DAC to create PAM4. Or you can basically have all these bits in the branches of your Mach Zender and perform amplitude shift keying. Um, a lot of these publications do not have electronics and have only photonics in them. So, um, so, but the trend is going to higher data rates and higher order modulation schemes. And if for the rings, you can do similar techniques. You can 
because as I mentioned, rings not only create amplitude modulation, they also create some phase modulation. Uh, so you can put rings also in each branch and create amplitude modulation and again create a DAC uh, with very low energy to combine the light. Uh, another option is that to have your PN junction segmented across the ring and drive it separately with separate drivers and create PAM4. For instance, this is a 20 gigabaud PAM4 uh, using ring resonators. So this is probably one of the most complete designs in PAM4 that has also temperature control. So with this, um, uh, I, I hope that I convinced you that it's very important to co-design the transmitter uh, photonics and the electronics because there are many trade-offs in terms of voltage drive, uh, insertion loss, and uh, uh, extinction ratio of the transmitter. Uh, but let me also talk a little bit about the receiver design because if we want to have a complete design that is very low power, um, again, these transmitter and receiver design need to be done together. One of the major uh, parameters at the receiver design is the sensitivity of the receiver. The more sensitive the receiver is, the also the, the parameter set for the transmitter is also relaxed. Um, and the reason for that is that if you look at the, you, you have your laser diode, you have to couple the laser diode into your modulator. There are some coupling losses here. The laser has 10 to 20% efficiency. Then there are, again, couplers and connectors and uh, the mocks and democks and so on. And again, coupling back to your photo detector and then the receiver. So the re optical energy that is required here really sets the power of the laser diode. And these are all proportional losses, including the insertion loss of the modulator here. So it's just to give you an idea what it changes as the sensitivity of the receiver changes. If the sensitivity of the receiver, for instance, in a high loss link, uh, changes from minus 5 dBm to minus 10 dBm, the overall uh, power consumption of the laser diode changes from 480 milliwatt to 150 milliwatt. So especially in the high loss link, if you have many components in your link, it is a, it is a great change in the laser diode power consumption uh, as we change the sensitivity of receiver. So it's very important when you talk about the receiver figure of merit, it's not just the power consumption, uh, that should be, we should look at it, we should look at the sensitivity, power consumption in electrical domain, and uh, the efficiency of our laser and coupling losses that are happening, and also the responsivity of the photodiode. So we can define a figure of merit that includes all of these components and try to optimize for this new figure of mer merit for power. So, but the nice thing, the good news is that as we move to silicon photonics and close integration of electronics and photonics, we see a lot of improvements that helps us towards getting better sensitivity. So for instance, if you look at photo detectors in silicon photonics, this is our collaboration with Letty uh, in France. And so now you can have waveguide-based photo detectors that are extremely low cap. So they are fabricated across the waveguides, and therefore uh, they are efficient, and they're very, uh, very high capacitor, and they very low capacitor, and they have good responsivity. responsivity. So if you look at this uh, photo detector cap, it can be less than 10 femtofarad. And now if we, we are able to 3D integrate this photo detector with our electronics using these copper pillars. Again, Letty um, was our collaborator to create this micro pillar based uh, 3D integration that includes, uh, in, introduces actually less than 20 femtofarad of cap. So together we have less than 30 femtofarad that we get from the capacitor of the photodiode. And that's actually really helpful in terms of increasing the, uh, the overall sensitivity and the speed of the receiver. 
But it means now that we have to do a better job of taking advantage of this capacitor. First of all, the front end circuit should not add too much extra cap. And also, one of the challenges is now is that you, you build a transimpedance amplifier, you very quickly you realize that the noise of transimpedance amplifier can be the major limiting factor. Also, the bandwidth that you can achieve at the front end uh, can cause uh, a reduction of data rate. So in my group, what we've done is that we actually on purpose make the front end very low bandwidth. We basically create an integrating front end. And then what we do in electrical domain, we, if you integrate first into the capacitor, then later on you can differentiate and recover the information. And that's what we do. Effectively, this front end looks like completely capacitor by having a relatively large resistor here. And by increasing this resistor, effectively you reduce the noise, the noise current of the resistor. And eventually, hopefully, you can get better uh, input referred noise for the system. This is given if you can com compensate and completely differentiate or compensate for this RC effect that you see at the front end. But keep in mind that this resistor is large, meaning that the RC time constant for our design is on purpose much larger than the bit period. So effectively, you see uh, a behavior like this. But then we actually take samples and we, in, we differentiate and basically compensate for this RC. And we compensate with this large tail here. Again, I'm not going through the details of it, but the idea here is that to, to not ha avoid having a very high speed TIA, instead have an integrating front end, but then in electrical domain differentiate to recover the data. But if effectively, because we cannot have an ideal integrator, we have an RC at the front, so we not only integrate, we also compensate for the long tail of the resistor, and effectively, you can think about it as a feed-forward equalization. So uh, this is the circuit that we had. This is the receiver uh, in 28 nanometer CMOS. This is the photo detector in silicon photonics, 3D integrated uh, together with copper pillars or with micro copper pillars. And at 20 gigabit per second, we got one of the best sensitivities ever reported using CMOS technology close to minus 13 dBm. At very low power consumption, we also tested this at 32 gigabit per second, of overall power consumption of about 150 femtojoule per bit. So this is uh, very attractive because it has also both low sensitivity, basically requires very low input optical power, and also the electrical power is very low. So we were interested to see if we can enhance the sensitivity of the receiver even further. And one way to do it is to use an avalanche photodiode instead of a normal PIN diode. And again, the great thing that recently has been happening is this advancement in design of avalanche photodiodes. Uh, if you look at the recent, one of the challenges of avalanche photodiodes is their speed. They usually are uh, lower speed because inherently the way that they're designed. Uh, also, whether they are silicon photonics uh, compa uh, compatible. Um, and of course, there is another issue that I will talk about, their shot noise. Uh, but this shows uh, the recent progress that we have seen in avalanche photodiode design. And uh, one of the latest designs goes up to 26.5 gigahertz. Uh, the sample that we worked with in the collab uh, that we got, we worked with a company and we got this sample at 20 gigahertz. Uh, this is the one that we, uh, we chose. We add the gain of eight for this device. So the latest uh, uh, avalanche photodiodes are shown here. Again, they are used uh, in silicon photonics platform using germanium, similar to other photo diodes that are nowadays used in silicon photonic platforms. So now if we take this avalanche photodiode, the motivation here is that um, it goes back to Ferry's um, formula that if you have your gain element as soon as possible in your signal chain, 
you eventually get better signal to noise ratio because the noise factor of other uh, building blocks are divided by the gain of this, the previous stages. So we all know about this as circuit designers. Uh, so effectively, if I put an avalanche photodiode at the very front that has a gain of higher than one, uh, then uh, hopefully I can get better sensitivity from this device. But nothing is for free. If you look at the avalanche photodiodes, they have a relatively higher shot noise. Uh, but the nice thing is that these things can be modeled very well. So in your optimization approach, you can take the, all these parameters together, the gain of the avalanche photodiode, uh, the shot noise, which uh, will be dependent uh, on this gain factor, and uh, uh, and this also K ionization factor of your avalanche photodiode, and basically try to find the optimum M that gives you the best sensitivity for your front end uh, after you include the noise of your, also your electronic circuitry. And then another thing that you can do, because these avalanche photodiodes have relatively larger capacitor, then again in electronics domain, try and compensate for the limited bandwidth of it with equalization. And by combining these two techniques, uh, we are trying to get a very good sensitivity at very high speed. So this is the front end uh, that we designed. Again, assume that this avalanche photodiode has lower bandwidth because there is, this is a high capacitor here. Uh, there is a transipedance amplifier, and then there is the rest of the uh, gain elements here. But this device is also a burst mode receiver, meaning that as the optical input power changes, it can very quickly adapt to the new received power. So now if you look at the pulse response of the complete chain, including the transipedance amplifier and the rest of the circuits uh, after your photodetector, uh, you will see that basically you have this behavior uh, that you have precursor ISI and also postcursor ISI. So the way that we do it, again, we look at it as a long tail system. So what we do, we take care of this long tail and also this precursor with our feedforward equalization. That is true, similar to integration and differentiation technique that we had. And then after we take care of this long tail and to a good degree this precursor, then we use decision feedback equalization to take care of the, the, the next tabs. And by doing this, we increase the data rate and also um, we open the eye to enhance the sensitivity of the receiver. So we call this double sampling integrating front end uh, that performs effectively, effectively two tabs of DF, FFE. And then we have two tabs of DFE to take care of the uh, main cursors uh, uh, that we have. And as I mentioned, we have designed this to be a burst mode receiver, meaning that if we are receiving randomly input data from different transmitters, uh, we basically very quickly can adapt our gain and our DC values to the new power level. It is very important if we can do that, especially in data centers, as different transmitters are sending data to a receiver, we can again save the power if we can remove uh, the overhead that is associated uh, with DC offset cancellation and amplitude control. We still have the CDR to lock, and there's also a delay associated with the laser that uh, should turn on and off. So in the interest of time, I'm not going through the details of burst mode receiver, uh, but it's very fast in the matter of two UI. The transimpedance amplifier DC offset uh, is compensated uh, with a new integrating technique. And also, we set the gain of the chain, the analog front end, very quickly so that the decision, because we have decision feedback equalization, effectively we need something similar to variable gain amplifiers in wireline communication so that the tap setting of DFE is not a function of input uh, power. 
So, um, so this is done in less than two UI. We very quickly, uh, we adjust it. Uh, this shows how this happens. Again, in interest of time, I'm going to go through this very quickly. But maybe this is the most important one. Uh, in measurements, we actually got minus 16 dBm of sensitivity at 25 gigabit per second. Uh, which is very good sensitivity. We designed this for about minus 20 dBm, but really experimentally measuring optical sensitivities at that point um, in the lab was very difficult. So we are not sure, we believe that we, our receiver is actually has higher sensitivity that, than this, but it's extremely difficult to couple the light at very low energy levels effectively um, in the lab in, with the equipments that we have. But still, this is very much better than um, all the designs that have been reported using just PIN uh, diodes um, in silicon and in CMOS technology. So this actually, this is promising. Still, there is a challenge with APD that cannot go to very high speed, but with an APD that has relatively lower bandwidth, we could show that we can achieve uh, higher bandwidth and higher sensitivity. Um, another way that we showed this is that as we, as we change uh, the input power, we actually don't need to touch the equalization settings. And once we set the equalization setting, uh, this is it, and uh, the receiver can adapt to the input incoming power. This shows the power breakdown. Uh, about 20, uh, about 36 percent of the power is in the analog front end, uh, about 12 percent only in the equalization, and the rest is actually in the clocking and data buffers. So as you can see, clocking is a common building block in electrical signaling and optical signaling that uh, uh, requires relatively high power consumption. And here is the uh, um, the summary, this was uh, um, fabricated in 28 nanometer CMOS, uh, and uh, a JSSC paper is coming out based on this design very soon. So um, I would like to um, conclude my talk here. I, I hope that I conveyed that it's very important when you have optical uh, interconnects to co-design your photonics and electronics, especially at the transmitter side. Um, and uh, and it's, there are many trade-offs that you can work with, especially if you know how to design your photonic circuits. It gives you an extra power to, uh, extra tool to, uh, to get a much better performance. And at the receiver side, I believe that the sensitivity of the receiver is extremely important and uh, an APD-based receiver can provide advantages uh, with the limitation of data rates that we have. And finally, as we move forward, forward close integration of electronics and photonics uh, will be more important, packaging and other uh, practical issues of coupling and packaging uh, uh, are among the other important factors in optical interconnect design. Uh, so I stop here, um, and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. So I just I wanted to uh, understand when you say co-design of electronics of photonics. So today, for example, there is a photonic house, and then there are certain experts, and they combine it. So. How much are we saving compared to those? I mean, um, so that's exactly what I, um, I I I was trying to say. That so now you have you have MPWs for photonics designs for integrated uh, photonic design, and basically as circuit designers, if you design your mod, especially at the transmitter side, if you design your modulator and your optical drivers together you will end up to get much better power efficiency. And the reason for that is that, um, is that it's just not the, uh, there are many trade-offs. So let me give you an example. For instance, you can design an electroabsorption modulator that, um, that is longer, 
so therefore it requires lower voltage, but it has higher capacitor. So depending on the speed that you are targeting, and depending on uh, the type of trans receiver that you have, you can trade off this if you have access to design of your electroabsorption modulator. So if you set the length of your modulator together with how you design your circuit, you can get much better results because you can, you can trade off, for instance, voltage drive versus the capacitor that you need. So a lot of times as circuit designers, for instance, we can deal much easier with capacitors because we can use inductive peaking, you can do active peaking. So you may choose to have a device that requires lower voltage but has a higher capacitor and do more, more work on the electronic side to compensate for, uh, for what you have on the transmitter side. 1.37 picojoule per bit, like iMac and others who are not uh, doing the hybrid electronic and photonic, what is the picojoule per bit they have? So again, we are, we are in the academia, so we, can, we, we are not maybe worried about all the reliabilities that they have, but we have shown with the ring resonators that we have designed together with our transmitter circuitry, we have shown less, we have shown 340 femtojoule per bit. Uh, so effectively, but again, it's not maybe the most reliable work the, in industry, as you know, there are many other factors that people follow. But again, in that particular design, we trade, we, we had a trade-off. We actually build a device that in optical domain has much lower bandwidths. And then we use pre-emphasis in electrical domain to achieve high data rates. And by doing this, uh, overall, we got much better power efficiency. So in all of these designs that you saw, we designed the pho photonics ourselves or in collaborations. For instance, we told the fab company to change. We set the length of the uh, shape of the device. We, we set the length of the phase modulators or amplitude modulators. and. Uh, and we told them exactly how to fabricate it, and then they did the fabrication similar to how we do for a CMOS technology. And, uh, and also how you integrate them can change things significantly. Again, you can trade off inductors versus voltage. Um, when you look at the parasitics that you have to deal with at 100 gigabit per second, every little parasitic matters significantly. Yes? Um, do you see any, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the potential advantages of, um, of uh, SOI CMOS uh, for, the, for the silicon? Uh, so the, the monolithic? Electrical, optical monolithic, you mean? Yeah, monolithic SOI, yeah. Uh, so Definitely, again, as you bring things more together, you get more less parasitics, and that would be the ideal world, to have them in one platform and uh, get the best power results. Actually, some of the best power results that you see is uh, in monolithic approaches. Uh, the challenge there is that you see that CMOS technology has continuously scaled. I don't know for how long, but now we have seven nanometer and five nanometer. Uh, really, when you put so much effort in bringing your photonics into your electronics, you always lag in terms of your technology node of your electronics. So in my opinion, we are not still there to take the monolithic approach. But if we get to a point that our electronics are not scaling anymore, then we can take the latest electronics platform and then build our uh, photonics in that platform. Uh, but right now, the best results that you see are actually in terms of speed are when you have a hybrid integration. Because you, you can make your electronics really high speed in 14 nanometer, uh, and so on, and very low power, and then separate your electronics and photonics into domain and get the best results. So, so like, uh, like a 16 nanometer SOI, that's a better potential. So I haven't, so yes, definitely, if we at some point we get to that point, 
I believe. Yes. Definitely in terms of integration, in terms of cost, if we have a monolithic approach, uh, uh, will be better in terms of packaging and integration. But another thing to keep in mind is that these optical devices are very large. So if you look at the area, you may not want very high cost technology to implement your photonics. The photonics can be implemented in a very higher resolution technology that is much lower cost, but then you have to integrate them together. So you have to look at the cost issue, which is a very big factor. So we are still not there that the, the area cost of 16 nanometer is so low that I can put a big, huge coupler there and a, and a big Mach Zender uh, together with my electronics. In mind for this, for this. I'm sorry. In this effort of yours, do you have any particular application in mind? Application is is for communications. Yes, or? these are for data centers. Data center, would right? Be the best application for them. Uh, right. But nowadays, even if you go to um, high performance computing or GPUs, you get to the point that you really reach the speed limitation. At shorter distances, also at very high speed, you get a lot of losses in your wires. Mm. And the belief is that eventually at shorter distances for maybe high performance computing or GPUs inside the box also we will move to photonics. But nowadays, a lot of companies are focusing on data centers because data centers, we are dealing with a variety of distances. We have half a kilometer to tens of meters, so there are a variety of distances, and longer distances definitely photonics wins, especially if we can do WDM. Okay, because uh, my impression is like, uh, at, uh, because as you just pointed out, right, that the, these devices are actually bulky, right, the optical aspects of, compared to the electronics, right? So when you are close enough that you can cover the distance with copper, perhaps many lines of copper will you carry? The no, the problem with, with that is that you usually have limited number of pins. Uh, okay. So you really, the number of pins has not scaled much, but data rate per pin is one thing that we are, we've been pushing to increase. Uh -huh. And then you also have actually a lot of applications, you cover the, the chip with your pins and you get limited by the number of pins that you have. But WDM tells us that we can have a single fiber and then launch multiple wavelengths into a single fiber and each of them, you modulate each of them 100 gigabit per second and you get a huge bandwidth. So eventually the area, the area that I meant is, is a still much smaller than the overall packaging area. Okay. The area on chip, especially rings are very compact. Electroabsorption modulators are also very compact. Devices that historically has been large are mocks and their modulators that use PN junctions for modulation. Therefore, they need long arms, relatively maybe up to a millimeter even. Uh, so, but those devices are now being replaced. For instance, instead of using PN junction for phase modulation, we are moving to MOS caps uh, that uh, that are much smaller and have a smaller form factors. Right. So now, uh, I'll follow up on that. <laughs> so, so, so now, when you put in account uh, the the pins um, and the copper loss and everything, compared to the density you could get with the optical components, and everything. Um, so, when optics make sense is after one meter or after. 10 meters, what? It also is depends on the data rate that you're talking. Right, right, I, I, let's yeah, assume you that you want the maximum you possible. If you want to go beyond, 10, beyond 100 gigabit per second, I believe even much shorter distances under a meter definitely still optics I see. would be. Uh, because for the problem with, um, with wires is that very quickly as you increase the data rates or as you increase the distances, you need tens of tabs of equalization. So if you look at publication, you see a huge number of tabs of FFE and DFE. I talked about DFE and FFE, but single tabs or two tabs, so that's the goal of photonics. 
that very little equalization, that is not very high power, you can get to those kind of speed because the channel itself is not lossy. Right. Devices introduce some bandwidth limitations. And those are things that we can actually deal with. That's the goal in photonics. Thank you. Sure. So now that the photonics and the electronics are co-packaged and all, do you see any issue of uh, getting the optical signals in and out of the chip, like attaching fibers to those things? So those are also have been uh, a lot of these are areas of research. People have worked on these grating couplers that are extremely efficient with very low loss. So you see ranges of 2 dB to 5 dB of loss uh, for the couplers, but there has been great uh, progress in that. Even bundles of fibers are now very nicely can be coupled into silicon photonics. Um, and a lot of research groups and companies have worked on that. Uh, so we've been using, because they are perpendicular, they are much easier for students to do, and a lot of companies also do. But, but in, actually, one of our designs, the electroabsorption modulator-based design is edge coupling. Uh, so uh, you can look at both, but we have been so far focusing on the uh, perpendicular grating couplers. Uh, Yes, but I believe that, again, there are a lot of research that has gone. Again, that's not an area that I have focused on it a lot, uh, but you can build them so that they are not polarization dependent. Um, you showed a 3D optical uh, receiver that has a TIA and a photodiode using copper pillar. Uh, what's the pitch for that copper pillar? Um, so I believe it's about the it's about twenty five nanometer I believe uh, micrometer I believe. Uh, let me see. So the device this is it's it's about twenty micrometer. I would say um, from here to here, if I remember correctly, it's about uh, forty fifty. Okay. Yeah, 20 micro, this is 20 micrometer. Okay. So it's about maybe 40 micrometer. Okay, what kind of underbump metallization do you use? Do you so. Know? This is Letty, right? This is Letty. This is, this is, as you can see, copper. I don't know all the details of all the material that they have used and they are not disclosing everything. So whatever you see here is all we know. Okay, so copper is a very good uh, thermal uh, material. And I wonder, have you studied the thermal or mechanical reliability of this? So you have a basically a CMOS receiver right. and a photodiode. Right. But if your CMOS receiver is next to some thermal um, virus mm -hmm. or thermal generator, it will actually, the heat will go to the photodiode through the copper pillar. Uh, That's a good question. Uh, we didn't have, so everything is very low power here. We definitely didn't have any problem. Uh, but, um, but, and also photodiodes are not very sensitive to temperature. Their noise performance changes, but most of the time we are really limited by the noise of electronics, not the noise of the photodiode itself. Um, so that's a good question, but we haven't really looked at it yet. I just wanted to make sure the 1.37 picojoule per bit did not include laser power, right? No. No. And how much is roughly laser power, like one or two picojoule per bit? Uh, it dep the good thing about laser power is that when you increase your data rates, the, the per picojoule drops. Uh, so it, again, is highly variant of how much optical, opti optical output power you need. Uh, from your transmitter. It depends on really what is in the link and what is the sensitivity of your receiver. Um, and it's a good question because a lot of these very small devices, for instance, electroabsorption modulators, 
if you put too much laser powder into these devices, they show nonlinear effects. Uh, so that's another aspect that, um, that is important to consider that you, even if you have enough laser power, sometimes you cannot pump these devices with very high power because they show nonlinear effects.